All right, today is lecture six. We've got a lot to do today. I have to go fairly fast, but as always, you can, I'll put these things in our shared folder on Google Drive. And you can watch the videos once I get them up. And typically, I get part A up late the same day, and part B, I don't typically get up till the next morning because it just takes too long to process and upload and process. Uh, and uh, I can't quite get it done, typically, in the same day. But you can look, go back. It's optional, but you can go back and look at the other videos. Wednesday of next week, we'll have another quiz, quiz number two at the mid-class break. Uh, again, a fairly short quiz, probably multiple choice again, and it covers sections 1.3 through 1.5, okay? So that'll be, uh, I'm trying to remember myself, I think that'll be, certainly through trig functions, I'm forgetting what section 1.3 is. Okay. Oh, that was the transformations of graphs, which we will we'll talk about today. I'm going to start with, um, a financial application of a quadratic equation, talking about transforming graphs, logical logarithms, and trigonometry. So we are covering a lot of pre-calculus content in just one day here. Okay, so pay attention. Uh, you do not have to write down what's on this next slide, just listen. Since we're going to do a financial application, I wanted to mention a business job that requires a thorough knowledge of calculus. Calculus is very useful for this business job, and that is the business job of being an actuary. Okay? So actuaries work for typically insurance companies. Uh, to describe what they do in a real short description is essentially they try to model risk and then help the companies make money off trying to model the risk. Um, you know, insurance companies, when you buy insurance, for example, for your house, you are paying the insurance company um, monthly or yearly premiums. Uh, that's the income they get from you, but then they cover you if your house gets destroyed by a fire. Actuaries try to assess the, the chances of the fire uh, in different areas. Okay. The wages are pretty good. They start around fifty-five to eighty-five thousand per year, year in two thousand nineteen, depending on the job and the company. Uh, experienced actuaries typically earn more than one hundred and fifty thousand per year. That's not one hundred and fifty dollars. That's one hundred and fifty thousand. Okay. Yeah, that wouldn't be good for just 150. The, the field of study is called actuarial science. <coughs> and some schools have majors in actuaries, actuarial science. We are thinking about making one here at Bethel, actually. Uh, we do have a couple of classes that help people study for actuarial science. Actuaries need to take many exams and be certified at certain levels. Actuarial associates and actuarial fellows are the levels of certification. Many of these work exams require a thorough knowledge of calculus and its applications. We have two classes, Beyond Calculus, that prepare students for two of these exams. Something called Exam P on Probability, calculus-based, and Exam FM on Financial Math. Uh, we have offered probability every fall for the past 30 or 40 years. We just recently started offering Financial Math. It has been a summer course since 2017, and this fall is being taught by a working actuary named Jake Smith for the first time. So I know many of you are science uh, engineering majors. Uh, if you decide you're not interested in science or engineering here in the next year or so, uh, but you'd still like to use your math skills, you can think about being an actuary. I'm somebody you can talk to. I wanted to talk about that because the first main content slide here is an application of quadratic equations to finding something called the yield of a two coupon bond. That's kind of a strange sounding thing. What is it? Well, first of all, what is a bond? You can purchase a bond from a company or a government entity like the federal government or like the state government or the local government. Um, you buy the bond, but that really is an investment. You don't do anything with the bond besides you hold it as an investment. You get some money back. Suppose, for example, you purchase a bond for $1,020 at time t equals zero years. Helpful to make a little number line. So here's time zero. You're going to purchase the bond for $1,020 at time zero. Then at time one, one year later, you receive what's called a coupon payment. Now, you know, the ordinary use of the word coupon is you are getting a deal on some food item, for example. 
So that's not what this is meant. You are actually getting this money. You're not purchasing something. Something you receive fifty dollars at time one. This is a two coupon bond. That's actually not typical. Typically, bonds have more than two coupons. But to keep it a quadratic equation, I'm making a two coupon bond. You receive another coupon payment of fifty dollars. Again, plus a redemption value of another of thousand dollars at time t equals two years. So here you receive essentially, well, that would be a thousand fifty. Let's go ahead and write it as fifty plus a thousand fifty or a thousand. Get thousand fifty. Okay, so you're paying this much, you're getting this much back. You're getting eleven hundred dollars total, but at different times. It's split among different times. So the question is, what kind of return are you getting on your investment? What is the annual rate of return, also called the yield rate, for your investment? Okay, it's similar to comp compound interest. Remember the compound interest formula that you should have learned in the past. Sometimes written as P. Or Okay, let's go ahead and write that. P equals A plus, or times 1 plus R over N to the N times T power, where A is the amount of your deposit. I think I do want to switch around the A and P, actually. Sorry. A equals P times this. This is the amount of the, the deposit, also called the principal. money you deposit. R is typically an annual interest rate. That's compounded a certain number of times per year. N is the number of compounding periods. With most banks that's four because they do it every quarter. N appears in this equation in two spots, and T is the time in years. So what I'm about to show you essentially uses this formula in this context, except we take N to be 1 instead of something like 4 or 12. And to solve for R, which is going to be like the interest rate over there, it's going to be what we're calling the yield rate here. We need to equate what are called future values. A is the final amount, final amount in, in your account over here, also called the future value. <coughs> what we want to do is, is with all, um, with the money we receive and the money we invest, we want to find the value of those things in the future at time two, and we want to equate. And if we equate those values, we can solve for R, and it's a quadratic, and we can use the quadratic formula. Here's the details. So this 1,020 is the amount you invested at time zero. That's like the P over there. R is unknown. We want to solve for R. N is one, T is two, two years. So this is taking 1,020 and going two years into the future, finding its future value. That's the investment amount. That's how much you put out initially. That needs to equal the future value of what you receive. The $50 here was at time one. That needs to get multiplied by 1 plus r to the first power. So that's the same as 1 plus r. And 1,050 is already at time two. So its future value is itself. <coughs> we want to solve that equation for r. That's a quadratic equation now. Now I could expand this out using FOIL and rearrange it and use the quadratic formula that way. It's actually a little simpler to do something else. First rearrange it this way, put everything on the left side and keep it at a zero on the right, but don't expand this out. Also notice I divided everything by 10 to make the number smaller. That's okay. As long as I do the 
And then say to yourself, hey, you know what? I don't really have to expand this out with FOIL. This is really a quadratic equation in the quantity 1 plus r. You, know, you can even give this a different name. You can call it x, for example. x equals 1 plus r. I can use the quadratic formula right away, like this. Not for r, but for 1 plus r. Right? I won't sing it this time. But there is negative v, right? That 5 there is the opposite of negative 5. Plus or minus the square root of, there's b squared, negative 5 squared is 25. Minus 4 times a, 102 is the thing in front of the squared term, times c, which is negative 105, that's the constant term. All divided by 2a, 2 times the coefficient of the squared term. Again, notice I'm solving for 1 plus r today. But now I can solve for r by subtracting 1 from both sides. Should I take the plus or the minus square root? You take the one that makes more sense. In this case, you want r to be positive. And it turns out to be the plus square root. And it turns out to be about 3.941% as the rate of return for the mm -hmm. But what is the on the first line of the equation, what's the, one, what's the 1,050 again? That's this total amount that you receive at time two. It's already at time two, so we don't need to find this future value. This 50 at time one needs to get multiplied by one plus r to find its future value. I am using the compound interest formula. I'm taking n to be one, t to be different things, and p to be different things. The p is 1,020 for the initial, initial purchase price, the initial investment. It was two years in the future. The 50 is what you receive at time one. The 1,050 is what you receive at time two. I'm equating these future values. That's the idea of what a yield rate means. And what does it tell you? It's telling you you're getting about this rate of return, which means you can compare it to other investments. If some other investment similar to this gives you a higher rate of return, you want to go with that other investment. That would be a better investment. That's the, what the yield rate is supposed to tell you. It's a way to compare investments. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you get the 1 plus r is equal to um, the quadratic form? Because this is, a, this is a quadratic in the quantity 1 plus r. You could give it a different name. You could call it x. You could replace this thing with x squared. You could replace that with x. And then you, this would be up here. But x is 1 plus r, and we do want to ultimately solve for r. As always, you should take the time after class to check things. Check these calculations. Make sure you do I don't have any homework problems on this, but I can put an exam problem on the first exam. Similar to this, I'd have to give you some details, but then you'd have to finish it just by using the quadratic formula. All right, now we're going to talk about transformations. You did have homework related to this already. I told you to watch some Khan Academy videos if you felt rusty on it, but I do want to talk about it here right now because it's going to come up in trigonometry in lecture B. <coughs> Transformations of x squared, I'm going to go through this pretty fast. Um, this is really a summary of things you should have already know or have studied already. First of all, f of x is going to be x squared. This is sometimes called the parent function of a family of functions. This is sort of the root. We can create other functions, child, children, from it. That's the way people phrase it sometimes. We can do horizontal translations, also called shifts, by subtracting h. Now realize when you subtract h, that is a rightward shift as long as h is positive. So it's like x minus 5 or x minus 7. But h actually could be negative. If h is, for example, negative 2, then this is really x plus 2, which is a leftward shift. So really, this includes both rightward and leftward shifts. Rightward if h is positive, leftward if h is negative. And it's best to probably just leave it like that. You don't have to expand it like expand it out because it's more clear what the graph will look like if you leave it like that. Vertical translations are when you add or subtract something from the output of the function. With the h, we were subtracting from the input. With the k here, we're adding to the output. And again, k can be positive or negative. If it's positive, it goes upward. 
If it's negative, <coughs> the translation is down there. Reflection across the horizontal axis means to negate the output. So you need to put a negative sign in front of the function like this. You should understand that when I write that, I really mean this. Why is that important? It, it's, it's of fundamental importance because it means do the squaring first and then negate. So when you plug in, for example, x equals 5 into this expression, you get negative 25. If we negate first and then square, that gives you a different answer. It gives you x squared. Square a negative number, you get back to a positive number. No imaginary numbers in this class. It's different. That comes up in reflections across the vertical axis. Replace the input with its opposite. But again, for this, this example, for this function, you get the same thing. In other words, Reflecting across the vertical axis for x squared doesn't change the graph. It looks the same. It's called an even function. It's got reflectional symmetry across the y-axis. Well, that's y equals x squared. If I drew it perfectly and reflected it across the y-axis, it would look the same. If a given point is on the graph, like 416 gets mirror image across the y-axis, which would be negative 416, is also a graph. It's not one to one, but more specifically, it's got y-axis symmetry. The evenness of this function is related to this even power of x, though don't, you don't typically think of it that way, because there are some other things like, for example, the cosine function that are even they don't have a, an x squared in them. Most confusing kind of transformation are probably this one, horizontal compressions and stretches towards slash away from the vertical axis. When you replace the input x by ax, it compresses the graph toward the horizontal axis if a is bigger than 1. It seems a little confusing. Most people want to think it's stretching. No, it compresses. It makes it go toward the y-axis. And stretches away from the y-axis if a is between 0 and 1. I'll show you some examples as we go further today. Vertical stretches and compressions away from slash toward, I purposely switched the order of these things, are a little easier to understand. They make a little bit more sense for people. Multiply the function output by a. This stretches if A is greater than 1 away from the horizontal axis <coughs> and compresses if A is between 0 and 1. Again, that makes a little bit more sense to most people. It's the horizontal one that's more confusing. I'm about to show you um, how to visualize these things in Mathematica. I'll give you another 30 seconds here to finish writing what you want to write. And again, I'm bringing this up today because this is going to be even more useful to think about in the context of trigonometry, trigonometric functions in particular, sine and cosine especially. These kinds of things help you solve problems with trigonometric functions where you're modeling oscillatory behavior up and down, which occurs in a lot of situations in real life. I will come back to that briefly here, but let me go to the mathematic at the moment. Uh, this one I essentially showed you already last time. So this section is about horizontal translations. And I am allowing H to be positive or negative here. If H is positive, it, it's horizontal translation to the right. Notice if h is, I'll make it more close to 2 here, every point got shifted to the right by 2. So this point went to the right 2 units, 
from negative 1, 1 to positive 1, 1 on this red graph. This point on the black graph got shifted to the right point two by two units to this point. It was 1, 1 on the original black graph. On this new red graph, it's now at 3, 1. Shifted to the right by two units approximately. All the points are getting shifted to the right. All these red lines have the same horizontal length. H can be negative though, and that's a leftward shift. If X, H is negative, like negative 2, then X minus H would be the same as X plus 2 in that case. That represents a leftward shift to the left by an amount equal to the absolute value of H. Visualize the horizontal translations. What about vertical translations? We're adding k to the output. If k is positive, the outputs go up. If k is negative, the outputs go down. All the y coordinates are getting k added to them, in this case 1.62. All these vertical lines have a length of 1.62 in this particular picture. That's a little bit deceiving visually. Because it looks like the black and red uh, curves are closer together up here than they are down here. But that's a visual illusion. Your eyes are focused on how close they are along a perpendicular distance, not along a vertical distance. These vertical red lines do actually have the same length, even though they look like they're longer down here than they are up here. So that's a vertical translation. Reflection across the axis negates all the y coordinates. The A here doesn't represent a shift or anything. It's just a parameter going from 1 to negative 1. It's sort of the multiplier of the output of the function. Ultimately, I'm interested in what is it when it's negative 1. <coughs> this red graph is a reflection of the black graph. What happened? All the x coordinates stayed the same, but all the y coordinates got negated. Here is a reflection across the vertical. And with x squared, you get the exact same graph when you reflect across the vertical. You kind of got to imagine that happening in like a, a third dimension coming out of the screen at you. It's like a rotation. But the end result when A is negative 1 here, is the red graph is the same as the black graph after the reflection. Here's the hard one, and I think I'll, I'll end with this one. Actually, no, I'm not going to end this one. This one's the compression or stretch. A now is being multiplied times the input of the function, f of A times x. When A is bigger than 1, it does not stretch horizontally, it compresses. Like that. For example, when A is 2, the red graph looks like that. All those points are twice as close to the y-axis as they were before. For example, the black graph, point, let's take this point, the point 2, 4. When A is 2, it comes, goes to the point 1, 4. The Y coordinate stayed the same, but the X coordinate got cut in half. Why? If A is 2, and you replace X with 1 here, you get the original function value of 2, which was 4, when I replace X with 1. Just think about it in terms of plugging points. When you plug in an x coordinate that's half of what it was before for that same output, the original black graph goes to the point 2, 4, but for this new function f of 2x, when I replace x with 1, the output is 4. So it's got to be that way if you think about it in terms of plugging numbers. It does go to the point 1, 4. It's got to be a compression. And on the other hand, if a is between 0 and 1, then it's a stretch. Like if A is 0.5 or so, those, those points are now all twice as far away from the horizontal. 
fibroblasts. Vertical compressions and stretches are a little easier to understand. As A gets bigger than 1, it is a vertical stretch. Those vertical lines do not have the same length, by the way. They are smaller down here than they are up there, as you can pretty clearly see. Because this property is true, look at this property, right here. For y equals x squared, a horizontal compression can actually be equivalent to a vertical stretch. Horizontal compression by a factor of 2, making all the points twice as close to the y-axis, gives you the same function as multiplying the original function by 4, which is a vertical stretch by a factor of 3. And this code can verify that. I've got two different parameters now, an a and a b. The A does the horizontal compression, the B does the vertical stretch, and look, you get the exact same graph at the end. <coughs> That's pretty cool. We're going to do a similar kind of thing with logarithms today. Okay. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. Again, you can look at this at the class I'll put in the Google Drive. Here. Anymore. Actually, I'm going to skip this slide, this slide as well. This slide is just about <laughs> vertex forms in terms of transformations. It's worth looking at after class, but for the sake of time, I'm going to skip it. Let's end lecture one by reviewing the properties of logarithms that we talked about last time. Okay. We have the defining properties. What were the defining properties? The defining properties of logs are that B raised to the log base B, well, let's go ahead and call it Y like I initially did, of Y power equals Y for all positive Y. I could call that X. But just to be consistent with what we did initially last time, we called y. And log base b of b to the x, I'll call this x to be consistent, is equal to x for all x. x does not have to be positive. It can be any real number. Those are the defined properties. What are these other properties that are true with the usual conditions on b that it's positive not equal to 1? There's this one log base little b of capital A times capital B, the log of this product is the sum of the logs of each factor. It's worth writing down even in words here. The log of a product of two numbers is the sum of the log of each factor in the original product. Okay? That is worth writing down in words, like I just said. Logarithms, in a sense, convert multiplication to addition. You can also say they convert division to subtraction, which shouldn't be surprising. After all, division really is equivalent to multiplication. And subtraction is really equivalent to addition. Log base B of A divided by capital B, I'm assuming these are positive, so I'm not dividing by zero here, that's the same as log base B of A times 1 over B. That's going to be the same as log base b of a plus log base b of 1 over b. And this turns out, I'm not going to explain it at the moment, to equal minus log base b of b. People have a hard time remembering these things, but they do make sense if you think about examples. And we will, in lecture b, at the start of lecture b today, do a proof of the first one, a rigorous polished proof. There's a third one. Log base b of a to a power is that power times the log base b of a. A must be positive, but p can be a. 
So again, what's coming up in lecture B is a proof of the first one of these. I might put a proof of one of these on the exam. You should be able to handle it in a general case for an arbitrary B. You should be able to handle it in special cases when B is 10 or E, for example. We'll also think about what these mean graphically and go into trigonometry in lecture B. Let's take our break.